This Michelangelo show is full of grace, in fact. So of, of what? Grace. Grace. So I would like to know what you wanted to show and what Michelangelo really invented and that you wanted to express in this show. It's interesting that you're mentioning the attitude of grace because maybe his contemporaries and especially the 19th and 20th century finds Michelangelo as the master of tension of the dynamic male beauty, no question about that, but a lot of tension is in it. And the grace is maybe probably an invention of his uh, followers, the Mannerist epoch from 1530 on. They changed the ideal of Michelangelo. The exhibition deals with, with the canon that Michelangelo invented in the late 15th century and the early uh, 16th century and it survived mainly in his sketches, preliminary drawings and, and of course in his sculptures where the ideal of the athletic muscular male nude became an unsurpassed uh, canon and ideal for the next 300 years. Grace, which we usually uh, associate with, with women, uh, <laughs> Is probably not his his greatest uh, power because he was interested in the fighting men. Think of but they fight with grace. I'm sorry. They fight with grace. Yeah, and the die. He want to uh, for me. He want to express the 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 motion. Yes. But there's still some grace. They are all Sometimes I ask uh, visitors to to hold for a moment, just for some seconds the body language of a Michelangelo drawing. And then people realize immediately that that's quite impossible because the shoulders go to one direction and the arms to the other one and the hips to the left and the knees to the right and you feel yourself torn apart in different directions. And uh, this kind of attitude of tension uh, might be the reason why Michelangelo's ideal was called the tragic of man, the tragic of, of the human being and, and not the beauty of the human being, although there is no question about his, his unsurpassed ideal of the male nude, and we are talking about the male nude, but, but the what did you female want, nude. What did you want to I show? I wanted to show that he overshadowed the next 300 years with very few exceptions, like Rembrandt and others who who focus on the ugliness uh, of, of... So what did men. he invent? He invented uh, the ideal of men. Even if he had to depict uh, the female body, like uh, the prophetesses, the Sibyls, he, he looked at a male nude. Mm, there might be different reasons. There were no female models available in, in the early 16th really? century. No, everyone knew how a, a woman looked like because obviously the mankind didn't die out. We, we still exist. But uh, for the students on the academy in Florence and other places, only male nudes were allowed and, and the female nude didn't exist. Uh, so that's the reason why the male nude is much more naturalistic. He studied on the one hand the ideal model, the real person, and on the other hand he had this ideal of the ancient uh, antique sculpture which were found in these days and, and this was the heydays. Uh, in 1506 La Ucon was excavated, uh. Uh, uh, 20-30 years later the, the Hercules Farnese was excavated and became the ideal for the next 400 years for every, every Hercules uh, image. So all these 16th century ideals uh, established the canon, uh, which was, uh, which lost its authority not earlier than with the modern age, with the late 19th and early 20th century. The outlook of the exhibition shows us how and why and to whom uh, Michelangelo lost its uh, authority of depicting the ideal male nude. 
And uh, so there are some exceptions like Rembrandt. What's yep. going on with Rembrandt, in fact? Rembrandt might call might be called the anti Michelangelo. Um, it doesn't make sense to just to underline the importance of the study of the real body, real females, real male, very uh, slim, uh, weak, ugly uh, persons. But he knew exactly that he was attacking at the same time uh, the overwhelming power of Michelangelo's ideal. That's why we call him the anti-Michelangelo. But did he speak about that? He did. He was called the ugly anti-Michelangelo who did not know that we have to long for the ideal, the, the beauty of, of what God made. Uh, and Rembrandt insisted that God made a human being uh, when the two, the first couple, Adam and Eve, um, left the paradise. Uh, so it's a beauty of ugliness. Exactly, it's the beauty of ugliness. I like this phrase very much. And it's, it's furthermore, it's not only true for, for Rembrandt, but also for the outlook of the exhibition, the end of the exhibition for Egon Schiele. The beauty of ugliness. The pathologized body, the, the sick body, the sexualized body of Egon Schiele is on the one hand ugly, real, on the other hand beautiful as the fragile, the femme fragile uh, of Gustav Klimt, who, who was the opposition of Egon Schiele's. But uh, in, the, in the show I don't understand the, the reference to Dürer. Be, besides the fact that uh, uh, to see Durer drawings is always a privilege or a prince, okay. but why are you showing Durer? He's a contemporary of uh, Michelangelo. He's right? a contemporary of Michelangelo, and both have the same longing. The same longing, meaning, how does the ideal body look like? Michelangelo had one answer: study the real person through the eyes of the antique ideal of the antique sculptures. Dürer had another question and another answer. He wanted to know how does the ideal body look like. He studied the real body, naturalism. On the other hand, he thought there must be a law behind all that. There must be, there must be measures, there must be uh, a geometry of the body and he constructed the body. And to make sure that these are two ways of looking for the same ideal result led to two different But even if Durer went to Italy, there was no interaction between them. Uh, no, but he knew him, of course. Uh, and he Durer. saw his work? No, he couldn't see his work because it was only in, in Venice. There were some rumors that for a short period Dürer was also in Rome, but we have no sources for that on their painting. So there's not really, you just, because when Dürer appears in the show, one really not understands the connection. Oh yes, because you, you, have, you have to consider that Michelangelo's ideal was immediately uh, reproduced in etchings and, and in, in engravings. So his ideal, looking at antique sculpture and nature at the same time, was well known all over the world, Western world, all over Europe. By Dürer either, or not? Also by Dürer, either because they knew the original sculptures and drawings, they called Florence and his uh, drawings and sketches for the Battle of Karshina, the school of the world, or by the etchings and engravings after Michelangelo. But there was no interaction really? No. Okay. Just, in a way, it's just for the pleasure of seeing Dürer again, right? No, just to make clear that the epoch looked for the ideal body. And there were two different ways to find it. Mm. To construct it, to find the law behind all what appears obviously uh, very uh, superficial. And on the other hand, by studying the antique ideal sculptures that were excavated at the time in Rome. And... Um... Could you remind us, uh, because most of the drawings come from your collection, right? Nearly all of them. Yeah, some from Le Louvre, Louvre I've seen, and, and private collections. Museum. Yeah, I've seen one coming from the art market recently, no? Mm. One drawing oh, yes, yeah, Ma uh, no, Michelangelo, yes, was, uh, was 
uh, auctions um, maybe a year ago. Yeah. yeah, so you could have it. Yeah, for the first time it's on display for the wide audience, for the public. And the, uh, what, uh, what, uh, Wait, what it's country? It's, it's an early collection. Uh, I can't say that. I don't want. It's to a continent. Uh, it's Europe. Uh, it's a it's a drawing that was is, is very important because it shows that Michelangelo started from the very beginning on in studying Masolino and Masaccio, mm. uh, not his immediate precursors. He wasn't interested in art in 1480s. He was interested in the art of 1430s. And he started the frescoes in Santa Maria del Carmine and others by Masaccio in, in artists who, who really looked at the heaviness, at the weight, the gravity of persons and, and uh, men and women. And so, um, how many drawings is there in your collection? In your collection? In total? Mm. By Michelangelo? Or in total? Uh, uh, in total, we have 66,000 drawings and 950,000 prints and another 100,000 paintings, sculptures and other media. We have uh, 16 drawings by Michelangelo, uh, both sides. And um, the question is how many Michelangelo drawings survived? You do know probably that there are, uh, on the one hand, the extremists who say probably only 40 drawings survived. Our provenances are very famous because uh, no less artists than Peter Paul Rubens Owned them. Mm -hmm. Even some other drawings that are exhibitions, like the Rosso Fiorentino, the, uh, the Pietà, the, uh, the Dead Christ, was formerly, while Dürer possessed the drawing, uh, attributed to Michelangelo Buonarroti. Uh, and on the other side, there are those, and I'm in favor of, of that opinion, that about 200 drawings by Michelangelo survived, which is not a lot. Uh, uh, considering that there are also architectural sketches and, and other mm. drawings. So we are very proud having this number of, of drawings. So you are, you are showing all your Michelangelo yes. here? Okay. And there are some facts similar, in fact. It's the first time I see in a serious uh, exhibition. No, some that, facts that's unavoidable. Because unfortunately, the backside, the verso and director side of the Michelangelo, uh, is on, on the top. And so either you show both sides and you can't see the second drawing or we reproduce the back side of the drawing ah, okay. and, and show it next to each other. Uh, in fact, you couldn't say which is the original drawing and which is the facsimile because nowadays we are capable of doing the very best reproductions that ever yeah, could true. be done. And we wanted to show both sides. Ah, That's okay. the reason. Okay. So for the, for the verso uh, side of the drawings. You think uh, what's the link between, as a conclusion, between Michelangelo and our time today? We admire Michelangelo, definitely, as like, like Leonardo, like Rubens, like Raphael, one of the greatest masters in art history, but we admire him. He is not any more relevant like he was till the early 19th century because his ideal of the male, athletic, nude, the fighter, the soldier, uh, the, the man torn apart you know, through his tensions uh, belonged to, to an age where we believe the individuality of a person who is responsible. In a, in a time where industrial death is produced by the World War I, Second World War, by dying, by machines, uh, bombs uh, thrown uh, down from, from the air, this kind of ideal hero has no longer a significance for our understanding of, of a man. Mm. Um, when, when you want to understand our society, you don't look at a single hero, you look at the, at the circumstances, you look at the networking of a, of a company, of a bank, of the financial sector or of soldiers and armies. But uh, we could look at these wires as dancers. Yeah. Uh, I agree. And it becomes uh, the whole exhibition in total reminds me sometimes on a kind of a ballet. Of course. As all these figures are dancing, moving, showing us at the same time from different sides. It was only for a small time lap in the 16th century when they invented the figura serpentinata from all sides equal the equal beauty of a, of a sculpture, of drawings and etchings, even that we, we can show in this exhibition. But in total, the exhibition 
looks like a ballet. Yes, so it's contemporary. <laughs> <laughs> because ballet is very contemporary, you're right, yeah. Merci. I'll thank you so much.